much, Ty, and thank you again for everyone with the Sanibel Symposium for having me. Um, I know on the East Coast it's getting close to dinner, so if anyone wants to sneak off uh, for a quick bite, I have a small little gap in the presentation in a, towards the second half, so I, I'll excuse you. You can go get a uh, quick bite to eat for a snack. Uh, so for those that saw my presentation earlier, I just finished my DHA at uh, University of Mississippi Medical Center, and I learned there a lot about patient safety. Uh, that's led me to working with a new company, Warm Clinical Analytics. Um, it's not a name I from, think you're probably familiar with, but I think you'll be hearing a lot more from us in the near future. Uh, I'll be doing kind of a two or three part talk this afternoon. I'll talk briefly about the timing of uh, efforts to develop a new perfusion safety system. I'll cover what types of systems are out there in non-perfusion areas of healthcare right now. And then we'll finish up with a live survey, which will have a uh, short delay on it, but I think I've, I've logged it and I think we'll be able to overcome it. So this will be my first try doing a live web-based survey. So let's see how we can do here. So first, a few disclosures. Uh, I'm an employee of clinical, uh, Orem Clinical Analytics. Uh, I'm a member of the AMSEC Safety Committee. I do that work with uh, Susan, uh, but I'm not here officially representing the AMSEC Safety Committee. I'll mention a couple of manufacturers in this talk. I I'm not paid by any of them. It just happens to be the manufacturer that I'm most familiar with. <clears throat> so building a safety system from the ground up, let's talk about four components. Last year at this meeting, I did a presentation uh, that had pictures and videos from 10 uh, accidents from 10,000 cases that I had seen firsthand. Uh, I received a lot of positive feedback on that talk and that spurred me into developing this concept a little bit further. Um, so let's talk briefly about these four components. So the who is, um, I'll start off by saying I'm very excited to be working with Orem here. Uh, I haven't really been this excited about something since getting into perfusion school at the University of Arizona. Orem has several projects in the pipeline. You can view their website, um, but I am specifically working with the patient safety aspect uh, that we're trying to conquer. So why would you want to build or rebuild a patient safety system specifically for perfusion? And there's really four subcomponents uh, in my mind that make this an opportune time. Uh, first, I'm most familiar with TALIS, and uh, Sean uh, talked earlier about their advanced clinical guidances, which was launched in 2018. There are other platforms on the market that I'm not as familiar with. Uh, hopefully, those platforms also offer uh, similar uh, abilities to incorporate clinical guidances. Uh, I think that there's been, in my talk earlier, I highlighted a rapid expansion of demand for perfusion services. It appears that the vacancies that we're seeing are really based on increased caseload and diversification into ECMO, and uh, that, lead, that makes us think of growth and not really necessarily a shortage of perfusionists, but more growth in the, the provision of services. And we also, I also know personally, as I see more and more accounts, as I uh, have a few more years experience, accounts are so heterogeneous. They, they don't have the same standards. Uh, there's a really wide range of what's going on in, in clinical practice. Uh, there's also been a handful, unfortunately, of very public mishaps that are connected with cardiopulmonary bypass. And finally, I think we're in the midst of a culture shift in perfusion. Uh, and I'm very happy to see that. I think we're approaching the midway point in that culture shift, but uh, let's talk a little bit more about each of these. So the first, um, the first point is, is the TALIS ACG. TALIS is unique. It can read from almost any device in the OR. And I said, as I said before, hopefully some of the other platforms can or will be able to do this, but you can pretty much connect to anything, any piece of equipment that a perfusionist uses, different manufacturers, you should be able to pull data from that equipment. Um, it's also the ACG, the clinical guidance part, is designed for users to be able to write their own algorithms, and that's the clinical guidance part. You develop your own guidances. Now, this can be really simple and effective things like setting a 10-minute alarm for cardioplegia, but it can be also much more nuanced, especially if you consider the possibility of working 
with a clinical guidance in a safety system environment. So let's take a look at what that might look like. So this slide I understand is very busy. This is a part of a case report I presented at the Winter Park Refusion Conference about five years ago. Um, the pump manufacturer, this was obviously the centrifugal pump, the capital equipment, generated this report following an oxygenator, a suspected oxygenator thrombosis that occurred at the initiation of bypass. And I'm not going to go over the whole case report again, I won't get too granular, but uh, in retrospect, this graph helped me and helped the peer review committee that reviewed this case understand what really happened and we could take it along with the observations of the perfusionists and the N plus one perfusionist that was involved with that clay case to really understand what happened and to not have to guess at what happened. And in this case, uh, this graph and all the data points presented helped us to understand that the perfusionist had been um, experimenting with different uh, clamp placements for initiation of bypass. And what they thought was an oxygenator thrombosis was in fact an errant clamp they left on the arterial line and in their panic to not be able to uh, initiate cardiopulmonary bypass and their immediate suspicion of a oxygenator thrombosis uh, just overlooked that clamp. Um, so I want you to think about this, in this case, luckily, uh, the N plus one perfusionist who was following the AMSEC standards and guidelines for staffing uh, came in, lended a hand or lent assistance uh, before the patient was profoundly harmed. It still took almost three minutes to establish circulation because that plus one wasn't in the room. But imagine instead, this is a rare occurrence certainly, but you take a combination of the RPM reading, the flow reading, the alarms, uh, and maybe one or two other variables. Uh, maybe the fact that you had positive flow just moments earlier when you tested the arterial line. What if that pump prompted a, a, a pop-up dialog box that said, check for clamp on arterial line? That probably would have broken that mental freeze that the perfusionist had and they would have double checked for that clamp. At least that's something that you can hope for. But it would be a really unique aspect of using an advanced clinical guidance. Here's another case that I was involved with just recently. Clinical guidance could be very useful, uh, especially if you are pulling data from your heart lung machine. So I was the plus one for this case. I was in the pump room doing some administrative work and the perfusionist contacted me and said, this patient is really not warming at all. Uh, I'm going to get yelled at, something is wrong, can you come in and help? So I came in to help the clinician figure out what was wrong. So in this case, the heater cooler had just been moved in this operating room to a new location because they changed the dedicated uh, circuit for the heater cooler. And so this put the flow indicator out of view of the perfusionist. So I'm going to put the, I'm going to play the video now. And what happened is, uh, hopefully you can still hear me. The patient cooled well, but during rewarming, due to the strange torque on the line and uh, probably the, the braided tubing was a little bit old and the heat, um, it kinked the line. So the patient rewarmed, but the patient did not warm to the appropriate temperature or the, at the appropriate speed. Now, certainly you could observe this case and go back and look at retrospect and write an advanced clinical guidance. That's something that's rarely going to happen. Um, but wouldn't it be great if instead of having to call your N plus one or in the situation where you didn't have a plus one, you got a clinical guidance at a certain uh, temperature gradient that said, hey, something's not working right, check the flow on your heater cooler. And of course, that third point, the reason maybe it's a good opportunity to, to go forward now is this case that happened in Utah. I'm sure a lot of you have seen it, very unfortunate case. Uh, this woman exsanguinated into a trash can uh, after successful completion of a procedure. Um, it's tragic, um, but I would I will share that it's I've had multiple perfusionists contact me and say that they have knowledge of a similar event occurring or nearly occurring uh, in, in the past, and so I can say. A similar event has probably happened before, and unfortunately, 
unless we have a, a, a drastic change in how we do things, a similar event is likely to happen again sometime in the future. Uh, later on in this talk, we'll look at the Australia New Zealand incident reporting system and we'll notice that some of the trends in there, some of the events are reported almost identically year after year uh, and it's very troubling to see that we might not be making the progress that we think we are. This is the most public incident that has been happening, has happened in the last year, but there's been multiple other uh, reports, some joint commission reports that have been very embarrassing for perfusionists in the last 12 to 18 months. Uh, and so while those reports are certainly a black eye for us, uh, there's a lot of good news with regards to culture uh, in our profession. Gary Grist has done a great job of spearheading the creation of FMEAs. Those are posted on the AMSEC safety page and I will again give a great shout out to Susan. Uh, she's done a great, a lot of great work uh, leading that committee. Uh, last year, I think, or two years ago, they put out the handoff checklist uh, and have other great projects in the works. Um, I think that this commentary by Karim last year, uh, late last year in, in AMSEC today, did a great job of pointing out the role we all need to take in contributing to patient safety. I've only got a clip of the article here, but I encourage you to go back and read it. I think it was in the fourth quarter uh, issue of AMSEC today for 2019. So when we talk about, uh, those are the four reasons I feel it's really an opportune time to look at safety and safety systems and perfusion, but um, that might leave you still asking, how would a safety system work? Well, uh, a lot of people probably already have a safety system, especially those who are hospital employees. You have some type of safety system in place that's a, usually a requirement of accreditation. But let's look at how a theoretical example would work specifically for perfusion. So let's say you're at a, a nice facility, you do 400 cases a year, not too many, not too little. We know, and I'll show again the data, that serious safety events occur about uh, at a rate of about 1 in 1250. And uh, I presented some data here last year at Sanibel that less serious but still undesirable events occur much more frequently than that, maybe one every 250 or 500 cases. So if you have a safety system where you're able to aggregate larger numbers of cases, um, allowing identification, you, it, that will allow you to identify variables or may allow you to identify variables common to these rare events. So let's say you're at this 400 case a year facility, you like your team, you don't want to go somewhere else. You have a single serious event occurring once every two to three years. And it's probably not going to be the same event every time. And it becomes very difficult to learn from these events but if you can start to collect data from 10,000, 40,000, 100,000 cases a year, you can start to see a significant number of these events and begin to build an understanding of the underlying causes and also begin to develop, uh, in some cases, clinical guidance and in other cases, other clinical uh, suggestions that would help to negate these events. So here's, a sum, uh, here's the data. This is the data that I summarized in my talk from last year. And I believe these are all the major studies on error or serious error event rates during cardio, uh, cardiopulmonary bypass. Um, as you can see, we really haven't made much sustained progress, although we've had very significant advances in our equipment. Uh, all of these studies were not in the United States, but they all were in first world countries. Uh, it spans a period of 30 years. Um, and uh, I think it really speaks for itself. If the airline industry, given our, except for our current status, if the airline industry had this record of serious safety events, it would be something like crashing two full planes every day, uh, 365 days a year. So that's the who, what, why, and how and so now let's take a brief look at the types of safety systems or reporting systems that are available in other professions. So this is the algorithm from NCC MERP for reporting a medication error. Uh, it's available, the font's pretty small, but it's available from them and, and the reference is down there. Uh, this algorithm, once you have an error, you enter into this algorithm for reporting. And uh, the main purpose of this algorithm is really to categorize the drug error so that it can be put into one of 
these categories. Uh, and so if anyone has ever attended a pharmacy department meeting at your hospital, you know it's very important for them to categorize any medication errors. Uh, further, their medication errors are categorized by type, but also by impact on the patient. So they have nine categories by type, and then those types are divided into four different patient impacts. You can see on the bottom left side here, uh, you have no error. So those are your good, good catches. Um, and that would be going to the safety two theory that we heard from earlier or heard about earlier. Uh, then you have error, no harm to the patient, error, harm to the patient, and error, death of a patient. Um, and so if you've gone to a pharmacy meeting, as I said before, you'll know they're very, this is one of their most important things that they talk about during those meetings. They will never gloss over this. Okay, this is a near-miss reporting algorithm from AHRQ. AHRQ is the Association for Healthcare Research and Quality. They're a department of, or they're a division of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, I believe. Um, it can be pretty involved, and as you can see on the right side, I think we talked about this earlier, or uh, Luke earlier, I think, talked about this. There's a loop where you're supposed to bring in any related events. So if you have a lot of related events, this can be quite an involved process for reporting. And this is the AHRQ algorithm for reporting an incident that reaches a patient uh, and harms a patient. As you can see, this is even more lengthy than the near miss report. Um, this algorithm is the basis for what is called a common format and in healthcare safety and reporting. That's for event reporting generally in the United States. So if any of you have filled out a hospital-based uh, safety report, most of those hospital-based systems are based around the common format. Uh, my experience has been if you really try to get all these details and get them into uh, this format, you're looking at a 20 to 30 minute time to complete the report. Um, but for those of you that are hospital-based perfusionists, there's a strong pro pro probability that you've seen something based on this before. Now, many perfusionists are not aware of MOD. MOD is the Manufacturer and User Facility Device Experience, uh, and that holds medical device reports submitted to the FDA by mandatory reporters, which can include healthcare organizations, device manufacturers, and some others. Um, they do accept reports from volunteer reporters, such as patients and care providers. Uh, it's tricky to, to submit one of those reports if, you're, if you don't do it regularly. It's not really very clear on how to do that. But their database can be searched by anyone. You don't have to have a subscription. So if you go to the, if you Google mod and you go to, you follow the, there's probably one or two links, you'll get to this search form. You can search their database of all reports. Uh, the search form's not too intimidating. There's only a few fields here. Uh, all of the, you, you need one data point to begin a search. Uh, you can have, I think there's six fields here. Uh, one, two, maybe, maybe more like nine fields, but you only need one data point to, uh, to, to initiate the search. Um, but if you wanna narrow it down, obviously the more data points you have, the better. But it's a little bit intimidating once you start digging into it. And the only problem really with the mod is that there is so much information available. If you look here, this is a screenshot of trying to search their database, uh, looking for a product that might be related to cardiopulmonary bypass. You really have to know what you're looking for and you have to know what mod calls that, that device or that problem. So here, I believe there's 40 uh, device uh, types uh, that range from aberometer to acetylcholine chloride. So 40 data, uh, 40 possibilities within the AB to AC range. There's just, I don't know how many there are, but there's a huge number and it can be very difficult to um, narrow down your search. Now, if you spend some, some t time educating yourself and really get familiar and search through what's available, you can get to some very useful information, um, but it, it is quite lengthy, or it can be. So after you teach yourself how to narrow down some of those 
of the near infinite choices, there is some solid data in there. Uh, these are this screenshot is the result of a, fi a search for five year window of problems with oxygenators. Uh, there were a lot of reports in here, but again, you have to be careful what you're looking at, unless you have unlimited time. <laughs> Maybe many of us have unlimited time right now, but uh, generally speaking, unless you have time to just peruse this all day, you can you can go mad. Uh, there's a lot of reports in here that read something like the following. Uh, manufacturers switched to a different type of blue cap and the blue cap fell off more easily than the old blue cap, um, which certainly has value. But the question is if you have to spend a lot of time digging for that, is that the most valuable or most impactful thing that you can uh, uh, incorporate or piece of information that you can incorporate into your pra uh, clinical practice? Uh, there's also a lot of reports in here that sound concerning but unless you go back quite a few number of years, the manufacturer has not done the required follow-up yet, uh, or the web page has not been updated. So uh, it can. There is a lot of information, but it's it's not quite needle in a haystack, but it's hard to get at. So those are the some of the general safety reporting systems that are out there in the U.S. Um, this is the only perfusion-specific reporting system out there that I'm aware of. And this is the PEERS-2 system from the Australian New Zealand College of Perfusionists. Uh, I think PEERS used to be called PEERS and now it's called PEERS-2. I think it's a fantastic system. Uh, they switched, they encourage reporting of workarounds and that's when they switched their name from PEERS to PEERS-2. So it used to be, I think, the Perfusion Incident Reporting System and now I think it's called the Perfusion Incident Reporting System. And uh, I'm sorry, the Perfusion Improvement Reporting System. And that's uh, concurrent with the switch again to safety to thinking. So now uh, they encourage reporting of, of good catches or situations where things could have gone wrong, but the, the existence of a, of a safety checklist or something prevented error and they Im encourage reporting of what went right and that goes back again to that safety to thinking. Uh, there are legal concerns for U.S. entry. This system is open. You can submit reports to it from anywhere in the world. Um, there have been some concerns and in fact I think in the last issue of JECT it was still cited uh, in a survey of peers to users that they had legal concerns about submission and certainly I am not an attorney, but it, I have been told that there's no established uh, protocol protecting reports that are submitted in here from discovery by U.S. attorneys. Again, that's secondhand information, but it seems to be concurrent with uh, reported, self-reported concerns about the Peers 2 system, even in their most recent publication. Uh, with that being said, I think there's a lot to learn. There's great incident reports in here. Uh, in the past, I've read these incident reports and made uh, clinical changes at one of our one of the facilities I worked at based on reading the report, identifying an error that could happen to us, and then making a, a change in our protocol or our, or our processes to help avoid that error. As I said earlier, uh, if you look through enough of the reports, you'll see pump head reversal or pump sucker reversal happens. It's reported in there almost every year. That's a troubling observation. So one thing that we see with these reporting systems and generally with medicine as a whole is that there's no one way to define a problem. Um, we can say medical error and uh, that is uh, defined as a preventable adverse event or effect of medical care and that's whether or not the evident it is evident or harmful to the patient. The Joint Commission uses the de definition of patient, patient safety event and that is something not primarily related to the course of the patient's condition. It reaches the patient and results in any of the following, death, permanent harm, or severe temporary harm. Um, I like the definition that AHRQ uses, which is a defect. A defect is any clinical or operational event that you would not want to have happen again. Um, so as you go forward building a safety system, if you're going to build something for perfusion, you have to ask yourself what is included, what definitions are you going to use, and as you look at other things available in the medical profession, 
it's definitely uh, interesting to observe that they don't all match. So this is the part where I start to ask the audience questions um, and I'm going to we're not starting this second, but I want to prep you all. If you at home in front of your computers could close your eyes, I want you to think about your perfect safety system. If you could snap your fingers and make it appear, what would you want in this system? So would you want to define the events that occur, the events that come into the system? Uh, would you want to categorize them? Is this important to you? Um, the World Health Organization uh, uses categories of harm to the patient, and that's what the Peers 2 system uses for categorizing their reports. Um, that's a post hoc categorization, obviously. Uh, if you wanted to understand some kind of event, uh, the bottom section here shows how you might highlight some of the categories uh, of factors that played a role in it. Uh, there's definitions for latent error and there's there's different probably four or five different contributing or shaping events in latent error. Uh, there's active error and there's at least four subtypes of active error and there might be sub subtypes of those active errors. So are those things important to you to understand if you were just going to uh, snap your fingers again and make it whatever you wanted it to be? If, again, you're in that situation, would it be helpful to have an objective review? Uh, this is the learning from defects tool from the AHRQ, and it goes over a series of contributing factors that are common in healthcare events. And on the right here, it provides a, you identify the factors that played a role, and then once you identify those factors, you kind of weight them in regards to how much, how important they were in creating that event. And then uh, whether or not you think there would be important to future events. Now, certainly this is subjective, but it does provide an objective process for you to evaluate the event. And this is another section of the same tool. Um, the HRQ then helps to develop solutions to any problems that you've identified. Uh, what I really like about this tool, however, is when you use it, you're supposed to be, you're supposed to evaluate the feasibility of the solutions that you've come to. Um, so here, are, they list the types of actions. Weak actions is to double check, okay? Uh, AMSEC recommends that you have two people check the perfusion checklist. That is a benefit, but it's on the weaker side of the actions that you could take. Um, but my favorite part about this Learn From Defects tool is the last part here on the far right side of the screen. The team's belief that the intervention will be implemented and executed. I can tell you personally that I've been in uh, root cause analyses in an organization and we were in the 50 or 55th minute of discussing an incident. Uh, I, my recollection is the incident re resulted in a patient death. And the person who was leading the RCA said to me, okay, so what is our solution? And I said, you know, right now I don't have a solution. We could do X, Y, and Z, but I don't think it would really be effective. And uh, they said, all right, well, that's what I'm going to put down here. And I said, you know, it's going to be nearly impossible to get a huge number of cl clinicians to follow this recommendation uh, tomorrow. And they said, look, when Joint Commission comes or when DNV comes, they're going to want to see something written down on this paper, and we only have a few minutes left, and that's what I'm writing, writing down. And unfortunately, very unfortunately, I think that kind of thinking, check the box kind of thinking, uh, occurs too often. And I think that this tool can help us move away from that. Okay, so now we're getting very close to the part that's really exciting for me. Uh, I want everyone to think about an event that they are aware of or that they were involved with. It could be an event, an incident, an accident, a straight out error. Just think about it in your mind. Uh, most of you probably have been involved with at least one of these type of events, near miss or reach the patient, maybe, maybe in something very serious. As you think about this event, consider the following variables. What equipment was used? Who used it? Was the machine interrogated, or would you have wanted the machine to be interrogated if it was not, assuming some equipment was used? 
were you able to gather multiple points of view or would it be important to gather multiple points of view regarding this incident? How many years experience did the clinicians have and do you think that's important to know? Were you or someone else able to capture photographs or video of the equipment or the results or something else that would be germane? Were there disposables involved and not just capital equipment like pumps? Were they at error or suspected to be at error? Did you ever get any follow-up? Assuming that this was, uh, this was something that was examined and not hidden, did you ever get any follow-up about this event? Is it important in your mind what order the data is collected in? Should they talk to the clinician and then interrogate the machine or should they interrogate the machine and then talk to the clinician? And would you like to be able to share that learning as the peers reporting system does? Okay, so in my earlier research today, I learned that there's about a 20 to 25 second lag between the time that I actually speak and the time most people at home uh, see this video. So I'm going to invite everyone to take this website, put it in another window of your browser, or uh, take it and put it in your phone. Either one should be pretty easy. HTTP colon slash slash etc dot ch slash hn5n. And that should take you to the direct link for my direct poll website where we can vote on these. And what I'm going to have to do is I'm going to advance the slide. I'm going to tell a funny story or a joke for about 20 seconds and then the voting should catch up and we'll see how it goes from there. Okay. So here it is. It'll I'll take about 20 seconds to text or talk slowly. Given a no this novel safety incident that you've just been seen or been a part of, would you want to be able to re report this event anonymously? And really this question is asking, would you want to be forced to put your name on the report or would you really rather prefer reporting this event anonymously? And again, we're referring back to uh, this report that you've thought of in your mind just a few minutes ago as we were as we were talking about it and uh, I'm not sure how many people we have at home we've gotten pretty quickly a 15 to 1 vote um, my suspicion is that a lot of the perfusion.com uh, Sanibel symposium faculty are here getting a faster feed than anyone else but uh, I think it's pretty clear and this goes back and um, we we don't have zero no answers. We have we have nobody who feels it's important to get your name on that report. Oh, we've got one now. Uh, you know, a lot of data in medicine in general says that uh, it's not surprising. I think that uh, anonymous reporting is uh, has a higher level of veracity, has a higher number of reports sent in, and certainly uh, in the situations where they're they're reporting serious events. Um, the number of reports increases a lot with the with the ability to submit anonymously. So I'm going to say this is an overwhelming yes here, and uh, we will move along to the next next slide. We need to go in this window. Okay, thinking about the same incident, uh, and as I. Uh, as I forgot to mention before, just go ahead and vote. If you at home are, are getting a lag on me and you move to the next slide, uh, go ahead and vote. Don't wait for me to come to it. Uh, given this same incident, would you want to have your equipment interrogated after the event to determine equipment settings before, during, and after the event? Now, we're getting a lot of yes votes on this, and I'm a little bit surprised because I think there's a little bit of a concern about um, Big Brother um, but I think that this, these results here are pretty surprising and we're starting to get a couple more not sures. Um, if you made the mistake, would you want to know? You probably would, but you'd also be concerned about liability issues. At least that's my suspicion. But we have a pretty overwhelming yes 
but much more of a not sure than we did with the uh, question for uh, being anonymous. So I'll move on from there. Okay, same incident. Would you want to get feedback from another professional uh, about this event? Uh, some people might just want to set it and forget it, uh, report it, do their duty, and then not talk about it anymore. Uh, but my cold heart is being warmed here by the number of yeses that we're getting. Uh, I am a little bit surprised, but it sounds like a lot of people, or it seems like a lot of people really would want to get feedback about this event. Uh, maybe even in the case where it's not uh, not very favorable to them. That's great. Okay, here's, here's what might be the deal breaker. Given this same event, would you care if your boss found out about this event? And, and just to clarify, this is, you're saying that yes, you would care if he, if he heard about it, or no, you don't care, you can go ahead and tell him. Uh, we're not saying that you would, it's not a no, don't tell him. It's a, no, I don't care. Go ahead and tell him if you want to. So this is definitely much more of a mixed answer. And uh, again, this goes to what Ty was commenting on uh, with Mr. Studer and his, some of his literature that states that your boss is really important to your work satisfaction. So I think that this goes to show that at least the majority of people are fairly happy with their boss and wouldn't mind if their boss found out about an event they reported. And this gets tricky when almost everybody wants to be able to report anonymously. Okay, we'll go to the next question. Okay, same event. Is it important to categorize the event after it has happened? Uh, as we saw, a lot of the other reporting systems function heavily on categorizing. Um, and we're getting a lot of yeses here. Okay, well this is, this is pretty strongly in the yes category. I won't belabor uh, this point too much. We'll go ahead and move on to the next slide. Overwhelming yes. So would you want to be able to share this event in an anonymous fashion? You know, it's a small world. If you we're in a case and you made a mistake, uh, maybe, it's a, maybe it's an active error. Let's say it's your mistake. Would you want to be able to share this uh, even, even though it's possible people might have identified you uh, just because of the procedure type or something like that? So again, I'm, I'm really surprised and heartened to see such a large number of yeses on there, uh, especially if you do it in an anonymous fashion. That's really... Uh, really a great number to see. Okay, same event. Uh, one thing that I've heard from perfusionists in discussing this before is that a lot of times when they report in their hospital events that uh, they don't they, they send a, a report into the ether and it just disappears. They never hear any follow-up. Uh, and I think that generally is true a lot of times when you have hospital-based systems. Uh, there's nobody there who's an expert who can talk to you about the, the, the problem and understand your answers or understand what might help. Um, and most people who have spoken to me about this issue have said that when they send hospital-based reports off, they the most common response is that they get no response. Uh, but uh, Certainly some people do, and some hospitals I'm sure address it very well, but the most common uh, report I hear is that there is not a good feedback or, or any feedback. Uh, but again, here we've got an overwhelming yes. Okay, let's say you've been uh, lucky and you have not been involved in an accident uh, or incident. 
would you want to have access to these reports or the conclusions of somebody who reviewed these to build safety at your institution? Uh, is this something you would look at if it if it didn't require uh, you know hours of drudging through data to get something that was fairly impactful to you? Um, I'm not surprised by this answer, but it again is very heartening to see a yes, such an overwhelming yes response here. Uh, okay, so I'm going to advance this, and sometimes this this direct poll gets a little tricky because it's a plugin that loads the website directly into my PowerPoint presentation. So if I get dumped off of the presenter uh, presenter position because it jumps out of PowerPoint, I'll jump right back in. Just give me one second. Ugh. It's going to take me one more second. It's the price you pay okay. for the polling system. Yeah. <laughs> Give me one second. I'll be right back. Okay, here we are. Okay. And that's, can everyone still hear me? So the question really is, as we finish up and open for discussion, uh, that was great information and I was fairly happy with how well it worked. A little bit tricky there at the end, but what would you do if you were king and uh, what would you want to see in a, in a, in a safety system? And I thank you.